In 258, in the midst of the chaotic years of the 3rd century, Valerian and his son Gallienus ruled the Roman world. The former was in the east while the latter took care of the west. Invasions, usurpations, rebellions, plagues and economic decline were widespread calamities at this time. Having spent much of his time in Gaul to protect the frontier, Gallienus, as his attention was needed elsewhere, proclaimed one of his sons, Saloninus, as Caesar and left him on the Rhine with Silvanus as guardian. In the region also operated a military commander named Posthumus. A major Alemanni raid penetrating in Italy was wiped out at Mediolanum. However, in the east, Valerian suffered a crushing defeat against the armies of Chapul I. The Roman Emperor was captured and later died in captivity. Such dramatic news triggered a direct loss of confidence towards the central government. Countless usurpers and local warlords seized power in their respective provinces, while invaders took the opportunity to attack Roman lands. In Gaul, Posthumus returned from a victorious campaign against Germanic tribes. When Silvanus ordered him to hand over the spoils of war, the legions revolted, wishing to keep the loot for themselves. They proclaimed Posthumus emperor, and the loyalist was soon besieged in Colonia. In an attempt to strengthen support, Saloninus was acclaimed Augustus, but to no avail. The city was taken. Saloninus and Silvanus were put to death. It was the start of the Gallic secession from central authority. From his power base in Colonia, Posthumus expanded his influence, having Gallia, Britannia, Hispania and Raetia recognize his power. Some of these territories had struggled to get the attention of the emperors in recent decades and were often on their own to fight back against the invaders. In Posthumus, the Rhine legions and the population found a rightful protector. When a major Frankish invasion saw some barbarians penetrate all the way to Hispania, Posthumus eventually crushed them and took the title of Germanicus Maximus. Unlike many other usurpers at the time, Posthumus did not make a bid for Rome. He had been proclaimed Emperor of Gaul to satisfy the local legions. That is why he stayed on the Rhine and continued to protect the frontier from both Franks and Alamanni, becoming the champion that Gaul needed. With such intentions, Posthumus was not directly hostile to Gallienus. The Gallic Empire was not really turning its back to Rome. Rather, it was a Roman state in Gaul which had its own Roman institutions, including a senate, yearly elected consuls and a Praetorian guard. With that, the westernmost part of the empire, safely protected by its legions, enjoyed several years of stability and relative prosperity, something notable during the 3rd century. Gallienus, having dealt with the usurpers as well as the most imminent external threats, decided to face the self-proclaimed Emperor of Gaul. By that time, Posthumus's power was well established, which made the confrontation a real challenge for Gallienus. The main force was spearheaded by commander Aureolus. After initial successes, this man failed to capture Posthumus and had to retreat back to Italy. After that, Gallienus led a second attempt by himself, pushing deep into Gallic territory. When the Emperor was wounded during a siege, the campaign was again cancelled. The victorious Posthumus celebrated his victory against Gallienus. A certain Victorinus had defected from the central imperial armies. Now with Posthumus, he became tribune of the Praetorians and was honored with the title of consul. The Gallic campaign weakened Gallienus. Aureolus, following his latest failure, fell out of favor with the Emperor. So, he revolted in favor of Posthumus and was soon besieged in Mediolanum. During this siege, Gallienus was assassinated by his troops and Claudius II took his place. In Gaul, the Rhine legions were dissatisfied with Posthumus' passivity. Indeed, Aureolus' rebellion had been a failed opportunity to march on Italy. 
the emperor had to buy off his troops. To do that, he debased the currency, thus diminishing the value of a Gallic coinage which had been of great quality so far. In 269, after Posthumus assumed his consulship, a certain Lelianus, following a victory against Germanic tribes, usurped power. Rapidly, Posthumus intervened, but when he contained his troops from sacking Moguntiacum, they, frustrated, murdered their emperor. The army thus elected Marius, a common soldier, as successor, by whom the troops were allowed to sack the city. His reign was cut short by his rapid downfall. Such instability convinced Hispania to break off. The Roman Emperor Claudius could not mobilize much troops in the west, but still sent a force which asserted control over Narbonensis. This show of force led Augustodunum to switch sides. Taking power in Gaul was now Victorinus himself, who soon attacked the rebel city. After a grinding siege, it was reconquered. Back in Colonia, the man was murdered for personal revenge by one of his men. Another short-lived usurper was acclaimed, but could not match the support gathered behind Tetricus. This governor of Aquitaine was backed by Victorinus's mother, Victoria, granting him a solid power base with which he became emperor. Despite his experience in the administration, the new monarch was faced with economic problems in his realm, partially due to the decline of trade and the loss of tax income. Indeed, Britannia remained loyal, but was far less valuable than the lost provinces of Hispania and Narbonensis. Internal revolts broke out, and Germanic invaders penetrated deep into Gaul. Successfully fighting off the barbarians, Tetricus elevated his son as Caesar, and shared the consulship with him. Meanwhile, the Roman Emperor Aurelian, having secured the Danube, was now on the other edge of the empire and completed the reconquest of the eastern provinces. Palmyra had been dealt with and Tetricus was the next in line. The tides of the crisis had turned. Tetricus contacted the emperor and it is said that the two men reached an agreement. The Gallic forces were gathered at the Catalonian plains. Here, Aurelian, with cavalry superiority, had a decisive advantage. As expected, the Rhine legions wanted to protect their interests and fight. Tetricus abandoned his troops and surrendered to Aurelian. It did not break the will of the soldiers and the battle started. It was a carnage. In the end, tens of thousands of Gallo-Romans lay dead on the plain, while imperial forces suffered many casualties as well. The loss of so many of the Rhine troops severely fragilized a border that the Gallic emperors had protected for years. Still, Gaul and Britannia were reintegrated. Faustinus, a provincial governor, who was already leading a rebellion when Aurelian arrived, was defeated by the latter. Tetricus I and Tetricus II, taken prisoner, were alongside the Palmyrian queen Zenobia, paraded during Aurelian's triumph in Rome. The deposed Gallic emperor, for his surrender, was appointed governor in southern Italy. The next year, the ever-active restorer of the world was slain by his own men, and the political crisis would only calm down a decade later. The Gallic Empire had been a symptom of an unstable and violent 3rd century. It was not without reason that this state appeared on the western edge of the Roman world. The empire was so massive in size that it had become too difficult to manage with one central authority. Posthumus and his successors, in fact, set a trend of future emperors and usurpers who would establish their power base in Gaul during the next two centuries of Roman rule in the region.